I'm joined today by coach and former professional football player, Phil Neville. Phil spent the first 10 years of his career playing for Manchester United, in which time he won six Premier League titles, three FA Cups and the Champions League. Between 2005 and 2013, he played for Everton before retiring from the game to pursue a career in coaching and management. Since January 2018, he has served as the head coach of the England women's team. He has led the Lionesses through a World Cup and several European and international tournaments. In January 2020, Phil announced his decision to step down from the position starting 2021. He joins us today for a conversation about his life and career, both past and present. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Phil. It's very exciting to be hosting you. Yeah, it's nice, nice to be here and I hope, uh, I hope we can have a, a, a good time and a good laugh. Thank you, I hope so too. Um, I wanted to start off by talking a bit about your early career mm. and your introduction to football. So you grew up in Manchester, of course, and you and your brother, Gary, played football from, from a very young age. Mm. You were even captain of the school football team for five years. So was football always a part of your life and your family's life growing up? It was. It was a massive part of, of our lives. But, but we, we also had, uh, I was also a really keen cricketer. Uh, so, so in the in the winter we played football. In the summer we played uh, cricket, and, and and I got to a really good level in terms of my cricket career. And and, and I'd say up to the age of fifteen, cricket was my first love. Uh, it was the one that I enjoyed the most, uh, and football really was secondary until I got to the age of fifteen. And then and then obviously with with having a sister that's really keen on sports as well. We 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 loved to go and watch the netball. My mum used to play netball, rounders, hockey. We we were very sports orientated. So up until probably the age of fourteen, we, we we threw ourselves into every sport. But football and cricket for me personally were the two main ones. Uh, and then at fifteen, I had a choice to make. I was playing cricket and football a lot. I was missing a lot of my education. Uh, and I was playing for, for England in both sports. And, and, and what, what, what we decided with the school teachers was that we, we had to sort of like choose a career path. And, and at that time, I was, uh, I played a game for England under 15s at Wembley. There was 80,000 on against Italy. And, and, and the, the whole occasion really inspired me. Uh, and, and that really was probably the main reason I, I, I made the choice to go and play football. So straight after school, you were recruited by Manchester United, where you were one of Fergie's fledglings with the class of 1992, <laughs> alongside Gary Neville and David Beckham and so on. Um, what was it like training and working under people like Brian Kidd and Eric Harrison and, of course, Alex Ferguson? And are there any mm. particular stories that spring to mind? Well, I think I think when I look back at the, you know, that age between 16 and 18, uh, back then, I think 20 odd years ago, we used to call it the YTS, uh, the YTS scheme where you was on a scheme for two years. You, you, you had obviously your football, you had your education uh, alongside each other. And I'd say that those two years were the defining two years of my career and my life, I suppose, in terms of the the challenges, the obstacles, the sacrifices that I had to make within those two years. It was, it was pretty brutal, I've got to say, 20, 20 odd years ago. It wasn't just the football side of it, the training, going full time every single day, two, three times a day training sessions. And, and back then we had no sports science, so there was no real science behind uh, sort of like the amount of work and running that we had to do. And, and it was literally... I would say old school type training, but, but, but what they did back then, they trained your character. They, they focused a lot on how to train your character, pushing you through through boundaries that you didn't think you could do and taking you really out of your comfort zone, both on and off the pitch. And I, I suppose the thing off the pitch is that if you think about we had to be in work at seven o'clock, we had to prepare the whole training ground as a YTS uh, player for the first team to arrive, for the staff to arrive. Uh, we then trained ourselves, which, which was the brutality of the new training regime. And then after training, we, we, we collected the balls of all the teams within the club, the first team, the reserves, the, the academy teams. And then we had to clean the showers, clean the boots, clean the kits, take the kits over to Old Trafford, make sure they were put in the laundry right, bring them back, set them up, fold them up. And I suppose then we, then, we had to then go out and train again in the afternoon. And then in the afternoon after the training session, we had to come back in clean the kit, clean the boots, clean the showers. And, and I suppose that for a two-year period really, really, really tested us. And there was days when I used to go home and fall asleep on the bus on the way home or in the car and go home and really 
sometimes you'd get emotional about it was hard, it was hard work. You, you, you really emotionally and mentally were taken right to the very edge to the point where you'd say, is this really what I have, what I have to do, want to do? And ultimately, because, because I really wanted to do it, it was just, you just had to get through it and survive and then prosper at the other side. And uh, I'd say that them two years, bearing in mind what I'd gone through uh, then for the next 20 years, were, were the defining moments of my life coming out of school where, where, where everything's done for you, everything's done for you at home, your meals are cut to the big bad world. Uh, it, it, was, it was fantastic, fantastic education. And I'd say that Eric Harrison, who sadly passed away, uh, recently was was the main person in that in terms of preparing you for and he used to say to us I'm preparing you for life not just for football uh, and and every single day there was challenges if we didn't clean the boots right if we didn't clean the showers right my, my, my job was the showers he would come down and if you cut cut to corner in any aspects of your football or, or your job he would he would absolutely come down on you like a ton of bricks and I think I think what it taught us was definitely to work in a team, the self-discipline, the accountability, and also the standards of what Sir Alex and Eric Harrison and Brian Kidd set us meant that nothing but the best was was uh, was expected. Did you feel like you had to give up any normal part of growing up or your teenage years to do this? Everything. Uh, I left school at, uh, at 16 and literally I cut off that part of my life. I, I made a conscious decision uh br- brutally really to just to say right right i had the best friends ever i had a great network uh i i literally just sort of like took them out of my phone book and said sorry uh, my path's different to your path i'm going on a i'm going on a path now where where I, I actually for two years didn't socialize didn't go out didn't have any friends outside of manchester united uh and i'd say that that was probably the best decision that i've ever probably made because ultimately when you look at the pathway of going to college and university, the lives are totally different. You know, you have to work hard, to make sacrifices, but the social side of it was one thing that uh, you cannot do as a professional footballer. And uh, I'd say that that cutting off at 16 from friends that were, were special was, was one of the hardest decisions I had to make. So you finally got to play for the first team in the 1994 and 1995 season. Um, Did you feel prepared for it at all? Had these years of training prepared you or was it an entirely alien experience? Do you know what? You you don't know if you're ready. You don't know if you've prepared right until you actually set foot on that field in front of 50,000, 60,000 and somebody is running at you in a 1v1 situation. So so I I think what we always... Uh, used to say to each other is, is that the practice that you put in means that when you get to the point of having to go out there and perform you will be able to handle any situation that goals uh, comes your way and I think I think that was that was the feeling when, when I got named in the first ever team to, uh, for my for my debut there was one of fear excitement trepidation uh, going onto the pitch but what you had to fall back on was the amount of hours that you trained and practiced and you had to trust yourself. And you, when you go out onto the pitch, you do not know how you're going to handle the situation. You know, some, some people I've seen in my career totally freeze, totally not being able to handle it, uh, be exposed uh, incredibly. And un- unfortunately for me, I went out there and, and I was the other side. I was like, wow, this is what I want. This is what I've worked hard for. This is what I've sacrificed for. And I, and I, I think that the preparation, the hard work that I put in helped me prepare for that moment. And I suppose it's like going into an exam. When you go into an exam in your final year at school, college or university, if you put the work in and you prepare right, you don't know how you're going to do, but it gives you the confidence and belief when you go into there for the big moment for you to produce. So you played for Manchester United for ten for over 10 years until 2005. Um, when you look back at your time in the club, what were your biggest takeaways? And also, how much do you think the club has changed since you left? I, I think the biggest takeaways, the biggest lessons was, was the, the incredible high standards that have to be met to become, uh, I'm going to say an elite sportsman, but somebody that, that at the top of their profession has to make. And that, 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 that I think the values are probably go beyond football. I think they go to, to any, any walk of life that you enter into. The, the, 
the simple uh, values that we had at Manchester United were were hard work, was was to have ultimate respect, was to was to enjoy yourself as much as you possibly can, and and to have a a degree of humility about it. And and I'd say that when I'm coaching now or speaking to young young people, young students or whatever, I think it's pretty simple that that the the real foundations and fundamental principles that you need. Hard work is definitely one. To get out of bed in the morning and get to work and to work harder than everybody else, I think it's something that you should be really proud of. And and the work that I've seen from, from football, you think about the best footballer on the planet, Ronaldo, say, for instance, people go on about his, his, his ability, his natural ability, but ultimately you've got somebody there that is 100% totally driven to work harder than anybody else. And I think that that is probably the, the key learning is what I give to, or I, I try and influence my team is that, you know, nobody comes and knocks on your door and gives you an A in history or, 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 a, or a Champions League medal. They come through blood, sweat and tears, through hard work and through sacrifice. And I think that those values are the same values that you have if you're a student, if you're an electrician, if you're a lawyer, or if you're uh, working on the front line on the NHS like, like the people are doing at this moment in time. So in 2005, you made the transition from Manchester United to Everton. How did the two clubs compare in their culture and which one did you enjoy more? Well, it, it, fun, funnily enough, I actually sort of like two different types of culture, uh, but similar values. Uh, and, and in a way, I loved Everton just as much as Manchester United. There was, there was unbelievable expectation and pressure at Manchester United. Every time you went on that field, you had the responsibility to win, to perform, uh, to be able to sort of like you, you was wanted, you was wanted to be beaten by probably every person in the world, apart from the, apart from if you're a supporter from Manchester United. Uh, so, so that brought massive pressure and massive expectation. But the values uh, that we had at Ever Everton, uh, the expectation was was probably not as great. But I'd say that the values were equally as strong in terms of the, the need for hard work, honesty, grit, determination, sacrifice. And, and in a way, in a way, I love that just as much. And, and, and I worked for two managers in David Moyes and, and Sir Alex Ferguson that were very similar in outlook in terms of the need for hard work, the need for pushing you more than what you think. I got to the age of, I left United at 28. When I got to the age of 30, David Moyes absolutely drummed it into me that rather than tail off my training, I had to double my training, work even harder, prepare even better. And I'd say that he, he played a large part in, in me being successful then for the next six, seven years in my career and having the longevity of playing at the top level to us 36, 37. And, uh, and, that, and people ask me about the values. The values were the same in terms of hard work, the determination, the sacrifice, and, and having a, a bit of humility about it as well. And the uh, most important thing, we, in, we enjoyed it. And, and, and that's, I think that's key as well. Turning now to international football, um, you were picked several times between 1996 and 2007 to play for mm. England, including being the youngest member of the Euro 96 squad. Yeah. Um, how do these experiences compare to those at the club level? They were totally different. Uh, England and Manchester United, I found totally different experiences. You, you, you had... Manchester United and Everton clubs that you had real deep affinity for. You had love and, and uh, all I ever wanted to do was play football for Manchester United. I've got to say that was my goal. Uh, you know, anything above that was, was like the cherry on top of the, uh, on top of the cake. So, uh, but I've got to say that when you go up and play for your country is that you don't realise the emotional... Uh, attachment you have to your country until you stand on that touchline and listen to the national anthem. You know, you, you can meet up for camp, uh, you can have seven, six, seven, six or seven days preparation and then you either stood on the touchline or stood on the pitch. And when that national anthem comes on, you realise you're playing for something greater than a club. You're, you're playing for a country. You're playing for millions and millions and millions of people that bring so much joy and happiness uh, to to a lot of people and and that that makes you unbelievably pr proud and 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 it's an experience that you can't really explain uh, because when you go out for your club th there is a bit of a siege mentality you you you're in a you're in a pressure you're in a pressure cooker sort of like uh, 
environment where where it's you versus the world. But for England, it just felt bigger, felt bigger, the, the expectation, the pressure uh, and the demand for success. And uh, I've got to say, my biggest challenges probably in my career from a mental point of view was, was probably playing for England. And are there any highlights from your international career that particularly yeah. stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, I mean that that, that Euro '96 tournament uh, for me it probably didn't get as good as that uh, for the rest of my international career. Uh, it was without doubt the greatest experience that I've ever been involved in in an international shirt. Uh, playing with probably the best team that I ever played with. Uh, I know people go on about the golden generation, but that team in Euro '96 was was the best for me in terms of characters, winners, spirit, determination. Uh, proper, proper footballers, proper, proper men uh, that that knew what to do, uh, that had unbelievable ability, uh, and and me being a young person taught me an awful lot about about the about actually what it does take to win. Uh, the, the the 2004 European Championships was was a, was an unbelievable ex, uh, experience as well in Portugal. Uh, we went there with probably. Uh, the, you know the golden generation: Scholes, Gerard, Beckham, Ferdinand, my brother. You know Heskey, Owen Rooney. You know we we had a great team, and that team should have won, should have won that tournament without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, it it was it was a uh, probably with that golden generation. It was probably the the. The, the only time during that probably tournament, the length of time that we went away, where I really felt the spirit and the togetherness and the will for every single player to be heading in the right direction. In Euro '96, we had we had 23 we had 23 members of the squad that were heading in the right direction. That were heading in the one direction to win. Everyone was all they were bothered about was that the team success. And along that would would come individual success, like Alan Shearer scoring all the goals, or or another player playing unbelievable like Gascoigne. And I think I think in England teams that I played in, there was only two instances where I felt like I did for my club. For my club, I felt warm, I felt comfortable, I felt safe, I felt as if every single player had my back. I felt as if if I, if I was in trouble, somebody would bail me out. With England, I only probably experienced that in a couple of couple of moments that was 2004 and in, in Euro 96 and what I would say is that I think what what Gareth Southgate's done now with the England team is made that England team fight for each other he's brought them together heading in the same direction and I think that's always been one of the challenges as an England manager and, and Gareth has done it unbelievably because you have so many rivalries uh, we had rivalries with Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool. And when you come into camp, all those rivalries have got to be put and parked to one side. And like I say, my, my England career, I only felt like I did at Manchester United once or twice with England. That was in 2004 and in Euro 96. Could you talk to us then about your decision to leave Everton and to retire from professional football in 2013? Mm. Well, I played a game. Played a game, quarterfinal of the FA Cup, uh, February, March, uh, and we 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 uh, we were favourites to win that game, and and we lost it. We lost it. I got subbed at half time. I, I played so poorly. I gave away a goal. I came off at half time, and and I'd been struggling with a bit of a knee injury, and I was very lucky in my career. I had no injuries whatsoever. I wasn't. I wasn't. Be I wasn't able to train every single day. I was I was it, my knee was aching. I was I'd lost that love of going out there and training, which was which was the ultimate for any professional footballer. And I came off at half time. I got subbed and rightly so. And there and then I thought that's it. I, I've got to, you know, people say you have a sign, and that was my sign. And uh, I wasn't going to hang around and just pick up a wage, try and squeeze another year. Uh, because I felt as if my time had come, and and when the minute that you stop enjoying going out to the training ground, driving into the training ground, then it's time for me to stop. We go back to the the principles and values we had at Manchester United and Everton. Enjoyment was one of them, and if you don't enjoy it, uh, then I don't think you can do your best. And uh, that's why I decided to retire. I'd already planned to go into coaching. I'd done all my coaching badges, so so I was prepared for the next stage of my career. Turning then to um, your coaching career, you held a variety of roles before joining the women's team as the, co as the head coach, including managing the England under-21s and Manchester United. How did you find this radical change in role from playing to coaching? What did you develop along the way? It was a massive shift uh, from, 
from going into work at nine o'clock and being home for one thirty, two o'clock to going into work at six, seven o'clock and not getting home till six, seven o'clock at night. I think that that from a from a a well being point of view, that from a sort of like total shift in in my sort of like work uh, was massive. Uh, but it was one that I absolutely loved. I'd been obsessed with coaching for probably five, six years before that. Uh, and when I joined Manchester United with David Moyes, the the, the 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 ability to come into training and impact players with your knowledge, with your sessions, with your with your energy, I, I found really inspiring. And you know, you talk about preparation. As a player, you turn up to training, you go out there, and everything's done for you. The session's planned. For a coach, it starts two, three hours before, even three weeks before, and you've got to get the planning and the periodization, uh, and 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 the direction of where, of where you want to take the team. And I found it fascinating uh, learning and working with, and bearing in mind I just stopped playing, working with the best players in the world. You know, your your Rooney's, your Giggs, your Van Persie's, your Ferdinands, your Vidic's, your Evers. These were these were these were world class players, and and as a coach, you've got to. Uh, Produce, produce, produce training sessions every single day. You've got to develop. You've got to challenge players every single day to keep their their learnings. And I, and I always reverted back to the best coaches that I played with, or the best teachers that I worked with, were the ones that challenged me every single day. And and that was the type of coach that I wanted to be. So in that first season, taking away the results of the team, it it was one of the most. Uh, unbelievable experiences in terms of my development as a, as a coach and a person. And I learned so much from the coaches that I was working with and from the experiences that we were developing that season, some good, some bad, uh, and some not so uh, different. So uh, it was a great learning experience. And I think I always, I always tried to take examples and, and, and of, of how I felt as a player and how I then wanted to be as a coach in terms of the challenge that I'd set a player every day and the personal attention, the care, and, and the detail that you have to go into to be a coach. Before we talk about the women's team, I quickly wanted to talk about Salford City, which you went ahead yeah. and bought in 2014 along with several of your Class of 92 peers. Um, yeah. What has your experience been with this club? Oh, it's, been, it's been the most, uh, most remarkable experience in terms of we... We probably didn't know what we were doing when, when we bought the club. Uh, it was in the seventh, eighth tier. Uh, there were 60 people watching. Uh, the, the tier below is obviously is, is, is like a Sunday league team, I suppose, or a semi-professional team. So we started right at the bottom with, with a blank canvas in terms of sort of like our thoughts. We didn't know, we didn't know sort of like where we were going to go, how we were going to get there, what we were going to do. But what we did know is that we were going to give it everything because we saw this as our investment in the rest of our lives. Coaching can be, can be come and gone where, you know, you can be, you can, you can go to Valencia, go to Manchester United, be sacked after 12 months. And then all of a sudden, what you got? So we wanted something to run alongside our professional lives. And uh, we started with, with our eyes really wide open then then you you realize that this is something that you absolutely love then you go and watch games get involved with players and managers and realize this is something really close to our hearts we're doing something really special and then all of a sudden we got promotion in our first year and that feeling of promotion was was incredible and then you think wow we want it again the year after and then we started we started to get a real fan base and then we we built a stadium and then we got into the football league and ultimately what we said at the start was we wanted to get into the Premier League. We we, we were play we, we we were a group of lads that that knew nothing other than playing at the top top level. So that's where we wanted to be. So along the way, we we set plans. We started to build the club from the bottom up. Uh, we were under a lot of pressure because there was expectation there, but it's something that we enjoyed, and uh, it became it, it's it's became it's become one of one of the most exciting projects that I've ever been involved in. Turning now finally to your experience uh, with a women's team, which you joined in 2018 as head yeah. coach. Did you have any association with women's football before this? And are there any unexpected challenges you faced when you first started? No, I, I'd, no, I'd, no uh, I'd no affiliation uh, with women's football. And it, at the time, it was one thing that I'd probably got criticised about, about I didn't know anything about women's football. Uh, 
And and at the time, uh, I suppose I, I felt a little bit, well, you know, women's football, men's football, ultimately it's football. You know, when I go onto a pitch uh, to coach a team, whether it's whether it's male or female or academy players or, or, or disabled, disabled cerebral palsy kids like I've done in the past, it is football and you have to adapt your style and you, you have to be flexible in your approach. And, and the way you speak to uh, a senior a senior player at Valencia or Manchester United, it's slightly different the way that you speak to uh, an under-18s academy player or, or, a, or a kid that's got cerebral palsy that, you, that you're putting a session on for. So I went into it knowing full well that I'd done my, I'd done my coaching badges. When I'd done my coaching badges uh, and every course that I went on, uh, not one of the courses stipulated that this was a course that you could only work in men's football. So the courses was to teach you how to coach football on a training pitch. So for straight away, I ignored all the criticism that, uh, that I didn't know anything about women's football. I then, I then, uh, I suppose, went back onto my experience was when I went to Spain. I'd never worked in La Liga before in Spain. And, and I threw myself into it, learning the style, learning the culture, learning the players, learning sort of like the intricacies of La Liga. And that's what I did with the, uh, with the women's team. And what international football gives you, because there's no game, because there's games every now and again, it gives you time to learn and to develop and to get to know people. But ultimately, these, these were footballers that wanted to play or were playing at the top level, that wanted to win a World Cup, that wanted to win medals, that wanted challenge. And wanted wanted a manager that would get the best out of them in terms of those challenges ahead. So so I ignored I ignored all the criticism of my appointment really, and I threw myself into into sort of like learning and understanding things uh, uh, about about female footballers, female elite uh, footballers, and and what I learned very quickly is that, is that female elite uh, footballers want the same things as male elite footballers. They want to win. They want to be challenged. They want the coach to to develop them, to make them better. And regardless of the gender, that that doesn't change. So so it was the the, the, the handover from me going from men's football to women's football. I actually found very very easy and simple is that they, they they wanted to be treated they wanted to be treated the same. They wanted the same challenges, and that matched my ambition. And 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 it's why probably from the start that I, I got this close connection with my players uh, because they, they, they saw the challenges ahead. They saw where we wanted to take the team. And uh, I suppose, the, I suppose the, uh, the biggest thing that I've learned over the last two and a half years is probably away from the football side of it, the, the technical football side, is, is the physiological side, is the, is the understanding the female body and how that works and, and the female mentality. And I, and I found that absolutely fascinating. Uh, understanding the physio- physiological side of, of the of the workings of a female body, because ultimately, females aren't males, males aren't females. In terms of the physical side of it, there are there are differences. How how you physically prepare a female player for for a game is different to a male player. And I think I think what we've done, we've brought specialists in, and I've learned from the specialists. And that's what you've got to do as a coach. You've got to get the best people around you in their field to implement that for the team. And that's from a, from a psychological point of view, that's from a physical point of view, and that's from a medical point of view. And, and I found it absolutely fascinating learning, learning about the menstrual cycle, learning about the physical, physiological approach for a female athlete. And, and I'd say that that's something that, that in, uh, in the women's team over the last two years, we've, we've been really, really brave and we've took risks in terms of that, that approach. And I think, I think the girls... The girls in the team have been really sort of like open to actually learning themselves about their own bodies, about learning themselves about their own menstrual cycle. And uh, I, I think it's now, now as I'm approaching the end of my uh, sort of like managerial stint with the, with the Lionesses, uh, I think there's a greater understanding that I think for women's football, there needs to be a bespoke model for the physical side, the mental side, uh, in terms of the preparation, you can't just put them both together, male and females together, and say one shot fits all because it doesn't. 
I've learned that over the last two years. I learned it very quickly that from a physiological side, we need bespoke model for women, female athletes, female footballers. And, and I think what, what we're doing at the FA now, we're developing that bespoke model. Um, so you've had several highs and lows in this role, the particular yeah. high being um, winning the Sugar Leaves tournament in 2019 and then reaching the second consecutive World Cup semi-final in July yeah. 2019. Are there any moments that you've had with the Lionesses that stand out in particular? Uh, so many, so many. Probably s s some are away from the pitch, uh, some are on the pitch. When we qualified for the World Cup, when we, when we went down to Wales, uh, that was a, that felt a special moment. That that was the first probably hurdle that we had to overcome. Let's let's get to uh, let's get to a World Cup because that was that was the challenge. We wanted to win a World Cup. We'd shouted to everyone we want to win a World Cup. So so qualifying was a big thing. Uh, actually, the fifty one days in France for the World Cup were probably the best fifty one days that I've, that I've had in coaching management so far. Uh, it felt like a club type atmosphere. Fear. We had we had 24 players and we had 30 staff, 50 50 odd people in the travelling party, and it just felt the most incredible 51 days of of sort of like the momentum changing towards women uh, female footballers. And 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 you know when I got the job, that the, there was there was many there was many probably uh, avenues that we had to overcome and and challenges that were set to me and. It wasn't just about getting a job in football and you had to win the next game. Yes, we had to win. Yes, we wanted to improve. But there was, there was, there was, many, there was many other challenges. And, and one of them was, was raising the profile of, female, uh, of, of women's football, um, get, getting bigger crowds to attend our games, making sure that you provided opportunities to, to female coaches. Uh, because there was a lack of opportunities two and a half years ago. So, so in terms of sort of like the the spectrum and the challenges within my job, there was many. And actually, actually the, the, the on the field stuff was, was probably no different to getting visibility for our footballers, getting us out in the open, making sure that when, when young girls go, go, go onto the street, they go with a football and they want to be the next Lucy Bronze, Steph Orton, Nikita Paris. Uh, and, and that was a massive challenge. And I've got to say that, that one of my proudest moments was when we when we left for the World Cup. Think about the way that we announced the World Cup by by announcing them on one by one on Instagram. That that blew that, that sort of like blew the uh, the players in terms of sort of like wow we are, we are now visible. We're now having live games on the BBC every single time. We're now getting an unbelievable amount of viewing figures viewing women's football. And I think the World Cup was the defining moment for. For women's football and uh, my, my biggest fear now is with with the coronavirus that I hope we haven't lost momentum uh, and I suppose the last game the last game that we had at home there was 80,000 on at Wembley which was the most remarkable occasion uh, quite emotional for everybody uh, in terms of sort of like wow we've, we've come a long way in a short space of time uh, still a long way to go uh, beneath the surface of the razzmatazz uh, there is an awful lot of work and investment and time that still needs to go on to keep the foundations really strong. And that's going to take time and that's going to take massive investment. But I hope this coronavirus doesn't set uh, women's football back. So a couple of months ago, you announced that you would not continue to manage the team after 2021. Mm. Um, yeah. Could you talk to us about the thought process behind what I can imagine must have been a very tough decision to make? Yeah, well, I, th I think when I got the job, uh, it was a three-year cycle. Three-year cycle of uh, the World Cup, the Olympics, which which we should have been this summer, and then finishing with the Euros in England uh, in 2021. That was, I felt, was was the the cycle that I wanted to do. I was young. I was 41 when I got the job. Uh, just just turned 41 when I got the job, and I, and I felt that 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 was three years to, to try and achieve something that the country had never had before, and that was to get a World Cup or Olympic gold or a European gold. Uh, ultimately, when, when you are in an international football, you don't get day-to-day -day access and impact with your players. I'm young, I've got energy, and I think, I think international football is definitely something uh, that, that is fantastic for short periods of time when you go on to camp for 10 days, but then when you let the players go back to your club, I think over the last 12 months or, or, or I suppose 
from the whole time here. I've been really frustrated with you then have to say goodbye to your players. You don't impact them for three to four weeks. You then get them back onto camp for 10 days. And, and it takes you probably three or four days to get used to each other's way of working again. So I think I always had in my mind three years of working in international football was, was going to be my maximum probably at this stage and time in my life. And uh, the, 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 the three-year process would have involved three major, major tournaments. And I think after three major tournaments, it's probably it's time then to pass over the baton to somebody. The, 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 obviously, with, with the coronavirus, which was unprecedented, nobody knew that it was coming. It's changed the landscape of, of how and, 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 and what we're trying to do. I, I, I will leave the job with only going to one major tournament. You know, the, the Olympics obviously has been, been postponed a year and the Euros has been put back to 2022. And ultimately... Ultimately, now that has changed the dynamics of, of the job. And ultimately, you've just got to go with it. I think we're in pre unprecedented times now where, where ultimately you want to uh, do the right thing and you want to stick to the plan. But plans have changed and you've got to be flexible with your thought processes now. And, and that's what we've done. Me and Sue Campbell, who's my boss at the FA, we, we, we've had frank and honest conversations about, about what's happening at the moment. And within that, the, 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 the plan has changed and ultimately what we need now is we need what's best for the Lionesses and that's, that's obviously me, me leaving in a year's time. So before we take our question from our members, I just wanted to ask a couple of general questions about women's football, some of which you touched on earlier. So there continues to exist this huge pay gap between men and women's football. Yeah. And the opportunities that both teams get on a national and international level. This is particularly relevant at the moment, given the case Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino are fighting in the US. So what do you think needs to be done and can be done to overcome this glaring disparity? Well, there is a disparity, uh, a massive disparity. But I, I think I think I think what's what's happened over the last two years is that that those gaps are slowly as are slowly uh, closing. Uh, and they're closing because of the success of the women's team. And, and I think that's really important. Now you think about the sponsors like Barclays, Visa, now coming in to sponsor the women's team. All of a sudden now, the, the, the revenues that the, that the men's side are getting are absolutely astronomical. And with that comes success and individual sort of like finance comes your way with the women's team. Uh, I don't think we've ever had that. So I think, I think the disparity has been probably pretty fair in terms of the money coming in on the men's side has been, and the men have been rewarded. But I think what we've seen now, we've seen a massive shift. Companies, blue chip companies, supporters are now investing in women's football. And what you've seen is, is that salaries are now rising, bonuses are now rising, sponsorship and opportunities for players are now becoming even greater and greater. And I think, I think I've always took the... Uh, I've always took the sort of like opinion that that this is that this is something that will come to us. This is something that is like baby steps at the moment to get to where we want to get to. And I am absolutely convinced that we will get to where we need to get to. It's gonna, it's going to need strong people. It's going to need strong characters. It's going to need people that will continue to uh, challenge the establishments of of companies, of of football associations, of clubs. Uh, but I think I think what we're doing now is I think there is a there's a visibility and acceptance that there needs to be more respect, there needs to be more opportunity, uh, and I think now slowly and slowly because ultimately you have to have a good product. And what we had in the World Cup, we had more people watch the World Cup than ever has watched uh, women's football before. So there is now a thirst for the product. With that comes success and, and spin-offs away from it. So I would say that we, we have made unbelievable progress. We are continue to make progress. Uh, but I think, I think we need to keep, keep banging the drum, breaking down barriers, breaking down walls, challenging people like the Americans have done and other, other, other countries now are, are getting to, to that stage where they're getting the confidence and belief and they're backing up with the results on the pitch. Uh, and I think I think I'm lucky that we work for I work for the FA that do great things and and they are breaking down these barriers without having the fight to go with it. And uh, but I just think the process will be continual and it, it it will take time. You talked about earlier this um, the fact that you built this kind of bespoke training program for women in line with their physiological needs. Mm -hmm. But this is something that obviously happened for the national team. 
what do you think can be done to improve the quality of training and to make sure that women and girls at a very young age when they're training in schools and training academies get a similar level of kind of bespoke high quality training yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think I think that is the biggest challenge. I think, uh, and it, it's it's about education. It's about education, not just for. And I think it's education for the female athlete, and I think it's education for obviously the coaches, the trainers, because obviously I came into the job two years ago, and I've been educated. I've been educated about about uh, cer certain ways to train, certain ways to. Uh, obviously act in certain situations in terms of the training programs for the girls. So that, that's come for me by being at the top level, by investment uh, and by education. And I think now what, what I think will happen at the FA, and it's happening in WSL clubs now where education and investment into, into uh, the research of female athletes, you know, you, you think about all the, the cruciate ligaments, ACL injuries that, that we've had over the last two years. It's been, it's, it's, it's been, it's been un unprecedented, really. And I think then there is research now going into that. Why does that happen? How can we prevent that? And then that is filtering down through from the senior teams into the academy teams, into the youth teams. And I think, I think again, this is a process that actually is, is happening in women's football. I know that, that Chelsea, Liverpool, uh, Arsenal, Man United are now, are now researching and educating their staff and, and, and their players on... On, on things that affect a female athlete uh, performing at the top, top level. And uh, I, I think it's, it's about education. And, and we say it about, uh, and I think the menstrual cycle is, is a prime example. We've, we've made subjects like that a not taboo subject anymore. It's part and parcel of a, of a, of a female. And, and, and within, our, within our Lioness group now, it is, it is not a taboo subject for male or female staffs or, or, or male or female players. It, it's, it, it's, it's part of a female athlete. It, it affects performance. It can enhance performance. And, and once we accept that, or people accept that, I think that's where we've made great strides. Chelsea do great work with, with their players on, on, on the, the, the menstrual cycle because we're working with the same people. And, and they've seen great results. Uh, and, and the biggest thing is, is they're taboo subjects. You know, people probably shy away from those types of things. I've never done that as a coach. I wanted to Im immerse myself, educate myself, because ultimately if we improve 1%, 2%, we're talking about the marginal gains that David Brailsford talks about. If we can improve 1%, 2%, the performance, physical performance of a player then, then that will give them the biggest chance to succeed as an individual and for the team to succeed as well. Final question from me before we take um, the members' question. Um, you said earlier about how men's football, or just football in general, is this cultural phenomenon that brings friends and families together. And it's something that you've experienced in your families, passed down through generations, it's talked about at the dinner table, that kind of thing. Yeah. Women's football, for, for a lot of families, for a lot of um, people, just doesn't operate in the same way and it just doesn't get a similar response. So what do you think can be done to change this culture around women's football around the world and in the UK in particular? Well, the culture's, the culture's changed. The culture's changed. I don't, think we can, I don't think we can sit here today and say that the culture needs changing dramatically. I think the culture has changed over the last two years. I think there is respect, uh, respect now for, for, for female footballers. Uh, female sportsmen in general, think about my sister, uh, with the netball team, the cricket team, the female cricket team, uh, I think there's a respect now in female sport. Uh, and last summer was was an unbelievable summer for for female sports. You think about uh, the athletics, the the cricket, the netball, the 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 rugby. Uh, now I think there's great respect. There's visibility now. So I think I think in terms of the culture, the culture is changing, and the culture has changed. I always think that when you when you turn on the television. You, you immerse yourself within a sport or a programme because you like it and you see excellence. And I think what people see now in female athletes, they see top elite performing athletes working at their absolute maximum and being successful. When, when the World Cup was on in the summer, people, people when, when they approached me in the street afterwards, uh, people were saying that it... it, it, it inspired the next generation. Well, I, I actually disagreed. I think we did inspire the next generation, 
But I, I think the biggest impact was in the older generation, the cynical, the cynical older generation that probably didn't respect female footballers, didn't think female footballers could do the things that they saw on the pitch in France in the summer. And when I when I walked into Costa Coffee or into a Starbucks or into any any environment, it was it was that fourteen older person that came up to me and said, "Wow, your team." was fit, they were strong, they were technical, they were skillful, the goals that they scored, the goalkeeping was unbelievable. What about the Norway team, the Australian team, the USA team? The, the impact of actually visibly seeing female footballers playing at the top, top level with unbelievable skill and tactical ability and, and physical uh, capacity, I think changed, changed the thoughts and, and affected the older generation just as much as the, as the younger generation. And, and when I now tune in to watch the netball, the first thing I see is, wow, what great athletes. Wow, how physically fit they are. How unbelievably technical they are at what they do. And I think that when people see top class uh, sports people playing at their absolute best, I think that inspires a lot of people. And I think that makes people tune in to watch. And, uh, and I think that means now that the culture has changed because what we're seeing, we're seeing the elite playing like elite sportsmen do, looking absolutely unbelievable on every, every facets of performance. Thank you. Finally, we have one question from the members. This yeah. one is from Tasnia at Green Templeton, who asks, um, what are your thoughts on Liverpool running away with the trophy this season? Do you reckon their dominance will last until the upcoming seasons? Well, I mean, they've without doubt been the, the, the best team in the Premier League. You could say probably for the last two years, if it wasn't for Man City last year, that 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 were incredible out of this out of this world type performance, Liverpool would have won the league last year. They 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 will or they should have or they could win the league this year. Nobody knows. Uh, but I think I think what Jurgen Klopp's done at Liverpool, he's he's not just he's not just built a team to win the win the title for one season. He's built. He's built a team that, that can have su 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 sustained uh, success. You think about winning the Champions League, finishing second in the Premier League, winning the Premier League again. They'll be challenging next year because he's, he's got a hungry bunch of, of footballers. And, and what he's done, his recruitment has been unbelievable. He's recruited, hung he's, he's recruited hunger, he's recruited speed, he's recruited players with aggression, players that want to run, run through a brick wall and he, he, he's, he's fostered a team spirit and you always think that a, a team mirrors the manager and I think at this moment in time no team mirrors the manager as much as that Liverpool team you think of Jurgen Klopp on the side personality character smiling enjoying energy his team play with those with those traits and I think they're a great team to watch uh, he will have challenges over the next 12 to 18 months two to three years in terms of Man City will go again because they've got great players and a great manager. Chelsea, Tottenham, Manchester United, Arsenal, they, they will continue to challenge. But Jurgen Klopp has built a team in his decision-making, I think, over the last three to four years because he didn't get success straight away, but he made decisions early on that probably gave people a little bit of pain but actually was thinking more long term. And I think I think what they've done, they've built they've built a successful team at Liverpool that can sustain this for the next 10 to 15 years. And normally in the Premier League, what we've seen over the last 20 years, teams go on runs of, of victories and sustain success. And Liverpool and Man City this moment in time have that. I don't like it, <laughs> being a Manchester United uh, supporter, but but it's impressive from the outside. Great, perfect. Thank you so much for being with Thank us you. today, Phil. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you and all the Thank best you. in the next few, few weeks, few months. Thank you and stay safe.